This is the second in a series, and it's Nikon Autofocus Explained on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between, or at least usually that's what it is. Today's kind of an unusual show. It's a special show. We're going to talk to somebody from Nikon USA about all the customization options and ways that you can set up a Nikon camera as far as autofocus is concerned and hopefully kind of demystify the autofocus thing for you. Before we get started, a couple of notes here. First of all, all the show notes for today, a little bit about my guest, uh, are all over at the website, which is behindtheshot.tv. Find this episode and you'll get everything that you need over there. Also, all the links to subscribe to the podcast are there as well, whether it be the audio only version or the video version in wherever you get your podcast. And of course, the video is on YouTube too. We'll talk about that in a minute. One thing I do want to mention, Actually, I say one thing. It's like four things that I want to mention. Number one, I woke up this morning with no voice. So for those of you that listen to this podcast on a regular basis, yes, it's still Steve. It just doesn't sound like Steve. Uh, next up, this is not an official Nikon USA video. This is the Behind the Shot podcast. It's just that Nikon has been kind enough to let one of their folks join us for this show and help us understand the autofocus systems that are on the newer, newer Nikon bodies right now. This is not intended as well to be a technical training. Like if you come to me later and go, what do I need to use for photographing a bird? Well, we'll try and answer some of that and some listener questions later on. But again, not so much a technical training as an explanation of the options that you have. And uh, I do want to mention as, as we're having this conversation, helping you better understand what, what you know options are available to you. I've got a Nikon Z9 in front of me. It's not mine. I borrowed it from my friend, Troy Miller. So Troy, hi, thanks for lending me the camera. It's much appreciated. And I promise I won't drop it, which is something everybody always says to me. But even though it's a Z9 in front of me, if you're not a Nikon shooter, if you're a Canon shooter, Sony shooter, Panasonic shooter, I, I recommend still watching this. And here's why. First of all, even though it's a Z9 and it may have some features that lower bodies may not have, a lot of these commands will still, or options will still exist on whatever Nikon body you're shooting. And conceptually, what we're talking about applies to almost every brand that's out there today. And last but not least, this is a podcast first and foremost. So when I did the, the Canon version of this show, Canon Autofocus Explained, which you can go find on the YouTube channel or in the podcast feed. Uh, when I did that, a lot of new people came that don't know that this is a podcast or the original format of the podcast. And on YouTube, people tend to just click a video. They want 15 minutes, get right to the point. Okay, it, not how I usually run this. So I usually start all of my shows with a small little interview of my guest, so that you understand who they are and why what they have to say might be important to you. That tends to work for audio and video podcasts. It doesn't work as well for YouTube where people are in a hurry. So for that reason, if you head down below the like and subscribe buttons down in the description, there are chapter markers. Please ignore me. Just skip to whatever section you want. I'm absolutely good with that. The whole goal here is to give you the tools to make you a better photographer or better be able to use the gear that you have. So with that, I want to welcome my guest today, Senior Manager for Product Digital Cameras with Interchangeable Lenses, otherwise known as DCIL, for Nikon USA, Mr. Mark Cruz. Mark, how are you, man? Great, Steve. Happy to be here. It's good to see you. I, I just found out as we were talking in the green room that you were at WPPI in February. Uh, I met your coworker, Jeffrey, there, and we had a great conversation. I wish I'd had a chance to meet you in person there, but I, I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate Nikon allowing you to do this, and I want your background. Oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, as a product manager here at Nikon USA, it's kind of my role to uh, work on the releases and launches of uh, all the new, uh, as you said, DCIL. You know, that's really our interchangeable lens division, whether it be D uh, DSLR or mirrorless cameras now. We're much heavily focused on our Z series and uh, bringing them to market. So that includes, uh, you know, working on the launches on the website, the content, the copy, and uh, really understanding the product because as it comes to us from the engineers, it has to be, you know, really massaged to make it uh, understandable and palatable towards uh, the public at large. So we work with our communications team and, uh, and uh, you know, try to pretty up the, the camera and our advertisements. But um, also I'm very technical with it too. Uh, in, my, in my previous role here at Nikon, I was uh, 
uh, working in a very technical role. So, uh, and I love shooting as well. So um, excited to go through the menus with you. So uh, you, you just touched on a couple things I want to, I want to hit on really quick. Number one, your technical role, you were a technical rep for Nikon Canada before you came down to the USA and, and joined the marketing team here. But you mentioned the word engineers, and I want to be clear. While Mark is not an engineer, I see your role in, as, as so important and so useful because in a way, you know how we've all always joked all our lives that engineers write manuals and that's why we can't use them, but they're the only ones that understand the product well enough to write the manual at the same time. You're the liaison between the average person and the engineer. You're the one that takes engineer speak and makes it plain English. Does that kind of really fit what you do? Yeah, no, it's funny that you mentioned the manuals because I actually have to proof them. In do English. you really? So I have to make sure that uh, things don't get lost in translation. So that's one of the roles that I play as well as, uh, you know, that's, that's manuals. That's more technical and very precise. Um, and then there's, you know, more marketing verbiage that might uh, make its way into the website. And really, we're trying to communicate an idea so that uh, people that are evaluating this camera for their usage aren't, you know, lost in the technical jargon and they're more inclined to understand the benefits of what the camera offers. So that's the challenge in marketing. It's really delivering a message that maybe the engineers conceive, but, uh, you know, uh, they need to help make it understandable and uh, relatable to the customer when they're looking at this black box to do what they need to do. So that's the challenge. That's the fun. And, um, you know, if we do it well, then uh, uh, their expectations when people evaluate what they're going to get uh, meet their expectations. So that's kind of what you, I do. you take engineer speak and make it absorbable is really what it is. I, I, I have one last question and then I promise everybody on YouTube. We will get to talking autofocus, but you mentioned you're also a photographer. So I just have to know, what is it that you photograph? Oh, primarily uh, sports. And that's uh, usually what, what, uh, whatever sport, any, any particular year that my kids are playing. So I have four of them. <laughs> so okay. uh, doing sports, um, I'm always kind of uh, fiddling around with the autofocus and trying to find the precise Thing that matches whatever they're doing. So one of my oldest kids plays hockey and uh, that's a challenge. So you have to, you know, work things when it's uh, changing at a rapid pace. Um, and yeah, just in general people, I like doing uh, portraits. So I'm, I generally know the flash system as well. So it's a diverse array. I'm, I'm the, you, I know the cameras pretty well. You photograph something that's perfect for uh, one of the, I, I put out there, hey, if you have questions, let me know as I get Mark on. And uh, one of them relates to sports. So that's going to be absolutely perfect. Uh, and then hockey, I have, I work at an arena photographing music, but their hockey photographer is somebody that I know well as well. Uh, so let's get into some autofocus questions first, and then we're going to bring up the Z9 menu and we'll go through command by command by command. And we'll talk about some customizations you can do with the camera too. So first of all, autofocus in general, specifically modern autofocus systems, which are greatly different from the early autofocus systems. Are there any commonly misunderstood aspects in your mind of autofocus in people's minds? Well, you know, when we went from DSLR to mirrorless, that was a drastic change because now the autofocus sensors are on the actual sensor itself. Whereas in DSLRs, there's an actual autofocus module that's in a sub mirror and there is, it, it's a separate entity than the actual sensor and doing so, um, there may be variances in a DSLR and, and such that we might have to fine tune it. And that, as a matter of fact, in our later DSLR cameras, we give the opportunity for the customer to fine tune it. Um, there may be variances with talking between the lens and, and the camera. Um, with the mirrorless cameras, because the sensor is on the actual sensor itself, uh, that variance is gone. So theoretically, uh, mirrorless cameras don't really suffer from front or back focusing as maybe was the case more so with a DSLR. So uh, the advancements in moving to mirrorless off provided that advantage. However, it is more processor intensive. So um, although the, the variances in, in discrepancy of back fo focusing and front focusing are less, um, it does take more processing power. And that's why 
you know, depending on what model you have, depending on the year, there might be advantages with an SLR and advantages with a mirrorless camera. But for the most part, um, the mirrorless cameras nowadays are already starting to catch up. And in the case of the Z9, surpass the DSLR. Um, one more thing that I will mention is that um, with the cameras nowadays, especially with the mirror cameras, we can do things that the mirrorless cameras simply could not. And that's completely adjust the focus shapes, coverage, and oh, yeah. lastly, the detection of uh, what we call, you know, deep learning. And that has to do with objects like human faces, animals, vehicles. Um, it can actually detect those. In our Z9, it can actually detect the cockpit of an airplane. So it can actually pinpoint that while, when it's shooting. Um, and that is uh, those, um, those focus arrays are simply not available in a DSLR. You're relegated to a cluster of focus points in the middle. So... All that to say that mirrorless has tremendous advantage for autofocus. And and now that you say about the cockpits of an airplane, now I know why Moose Peterson likes his Z9 so much. It, it is, there's no question it's a beast of a camera. And by the way, the day after we're recording this is when the firmware version and many people watching this know and have heard about firmware version 2.0, for example, for the, for the Z9. Uh, I don't have it on here because it comes out the day after this, but while there's a lot in that, a lot, by the way, for video in firmware 2.0, but even for still shooters, there's a lot in there for just photography in general, but we will touch on and discuss the autofocus specific features of firmware 2.0 kind of near the end of this video. So with that in mind, let's get into going through the menus. Before we do, I do just want to say a quick thank you to my friends over at dvestore.com for providing the high def video. It's dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And that brings us up to running through some camera menus on a Nikon Z9. And the first area that we're going to start is this upper left-hand corner, which is the photo shooting area. And the reason is because there are some focus commands here that we do want to discuss. So let's start with focus mode. Explain to me and I'll jump through sub menus as you need me to. Yeah. So this is a primary uh, option here that we would use. The focus uh, mode really has to do with the the way that the focus reacts when you're half pressing the shutter release. So what, what you have there, you see AFC, right? Um, usually, uh, when you when you get the camera, it's kind of defaulted to AFS. But I see the the person that had it, uh, what you're borrowing it from, yeah, uh, uses AFC, right? Try. So uh, actually, this is what a lot of people would use, especially if they're shooting things that are moving. So AFS stands for autofocus single. AFC is Autofocus continuous. That's what the AF stands for. That's what the C stands for. And MF, that stands for manual focus, where the uh, focus is disengaged from the shutter release, the half press on the shutter release, or the AF on button at the back, and you're simply using the manual focus rings of the lens to achieve focus. Now, with AFS, when you half press the shutter release, um, your focus will be locked on that plane until you re release the shutter and then half press it. Again, so meaning to say, if I half pressed the shutter and my subject were here, um, and it moved from here, you know, that proximity to the lens, I would literally have to let go of the shutter release and reacquire that distance. Okay, and that's what AFS is. So it's ideal when your subject is stationary. Um, it is absolutely unideal, not ideal if your subject is moving. That's where you would use AFC. So autofocus continuous. If you're half pressing the shutter release, as long as you're half pressing it, it will continuously track. Therefore, if your subject moves, it will track along with it. Gotcha. And in AFC, there are several different methods, more so than the a uh, AFS, which we'll go into in the next minute. And, and the way I think of it is AFS is a static subject like you're shooting in a studio. Uh, and, and I'm not talking a dancer in a studio jumping up, but somebody sitting on a stool doing a headshot as opposed to a moving subject like me with, with live music and manual focus with my eyes is not an option that I would pick, but I do know people who in critical focus situations, and actually that's not true. I do choose uh, manual focus quite often when I'm on a tripod and I'm photographing the moon and, you know, I want critical focus at that point and I'll go into a manual focus mode and, and, and kind of tweak it a little bit. So with that in mind, then let's jump back Let's go into AF area mode. So AF area mode, you see a litany of options there. Um, we're in AFC right now. So what you see right there, the first option pinpoint, that's grayed out. And that's because that option is only available in AFS. 
So the great thing about these menus is that if it's in white, you'll see that it is available for that particular combination of AF, uh, C, and then whatever mode you're using here. So what this menu is telling you is it is, it is showing you the size and shape of the autofocus point. So whereas in a DSLR, you may have had an array of 39 points or 51 points or three points in the middle. The great beauty about DSLR camera, excuse me, mirrorless cameras is that these points, uh, because they can be grafted throughout the entire sensor, can take various different shapes. So we'll start with the simple one, a single point AF. This is simply a one point autofocus. And when you select that, you will literally see a red box in the middle of the frame. You can move it anywhere covering about 90% of the frame uh, from edge to edge. That's another advantage of a mirrorless camera. And it's very simple. Um, it's uh, a lot of people like this mode because it's old school. Um, they can target it on a portion of the frame and not have to worry about it trying to find other things. Let, let so me inject here though, but the single point is, I, I'm guessing by wording and definition, same as a pinpoint, it's just a larger point. That's correct, yes. Okay. So the pinpoint, um, so the two differences, the pinpoint is a smaller point, the single point is slightly larger. However, single point uses something called phase detect and contrast detect, whereas pinpoint is only using contrast detect. Okay. Without getting too technical, the contrast detect is very precise. However, uh, it is very, it's slower than uh, um, phase detect. So when you're using any one of those options below there that are lit up right now, it's using both phase detect as well as contrast detect. Okay. So let's get into dynamic area. There's three of them. I'm guessing the SML are small, medium, large. Right. So the great thing about this is um, if you're, the way it works is when you half press, okay, the idea here is you're half pressing and it's acquiring the focus initially with the center point. However, if your subject um, eludes the center point, it goes outside of the center point, so long as it's within a radius around that initial point, it will remain in focus because what that dynamic uh, area AF is, it gives that single point a radius around it uh, that allows you some forgiveness room. So if your subject is moving erratically, it will not immediately uh, focus to the background. So for example, if the point was on me um, and I move, it's not going to focus on the wall because there's a radius around that point. And the radius expands from S to M to L, that's small, medium, and large. So if we were to see that overlaid on the frame, then you would see that uh, that radius gets bigger, the bigger that you get from small, medium, and large. And, and I will say for the Canon shooters out there that are still watching this, that's similar kind of to the Canon point expansion option that, that they have. Uh, so then let's jump down to wide area AF, which again, we've got small and large here. Yeah. So the, these are exciting ones here because uh, for the Nikon shooters out there, they might be familiar on the DSLR of something called group area. And essentially what this is, is in a DSLR, it may have taken a cluster of five points and it would react as one point. Um, the what wide area AF is, it's a physically larger square, which is the, the, the focus point that's acquiring initial focus. Um, and what's cool about this is this is the first focus point where you can actually layer on top of it subject detection. Subject detection is the ability to recognize faces of humans, of cats and dogs, animals, um, as well as vehicles now. So we can detect any one of um, cars, planes, trains, bikes, and motorbikes, so five different vehicles that you can detect. So you can layer that on top of the square. So if you have a subject that it resides inside of the wide area, it will further refine the focusing to say in my case, it would refine it to my eye if it can detect my eye. Okay. So even if the box is around me like so, it finds me as a human and then it refines the focus right to my eye. So if you're using a 51.2, it'll give you that more precise focusing. Um, the difference between S and L is that S is a smaller version of wide area, um, but, and L is a, is a, is a larger version. Um, but it's using that entire square to initially find focus. And then uh, we have 3D tracking right there. 
let's do it this way. Imagine single point. This is really when we debuted it. Imagine single point. Remember, people usually uh, talk about focus and, and recompose, right? So uh, right now I'm in the center of the frame, okay? So if you focused on me here um, and you wanted to co compose me off to this right or left of the frame, I'm discombobulated right now. Um, you're, you're, you're the, dis the proximity of me to the lens may change so, um, you know, the idea is that you focus on me, you recompose, and then you take the shot. But the problem is if you have a very shallow depth of field or if the lens has a curvature, by recomposing, simply recomposing, I may be slightly out of focus at this point. So what, uh, what uh, 3D tracking does is instead of just focusing on me, um, on that one spot that I was at, the focus point will follow me around the frame so long as I'm half pressed on the shutter release. So okay. this is only available in AFC because it's predicated on the photographer half pressing on the shutter release. And so long as you're half pressing, whatever you initially acquired with that point will track it. It evaluates color in the frame. So it's great for when you're shooting sports, it's picking that jersey um, and then it's following it around the frame. So therefore you can have more flexibility in recomposing. When I shoot hockey, I'm oftentimes locking on my subject and then reframing him mid shot, even though they're traveling, you know, really, really fast, just so I get a more interesting composition. This would be something that would be very hard to do if I were using a static point, because I, I would, I wouldn't have any guarantee that it would still stick on that subject. Usually it wouldn't, if I had to recompose, it would shoot to the background with 3d tracking. It locks on that subject and wherever I move in the frame, it sticks on me. Like a magnet. Let me, let me clarify something though. So am I to understand, correct me where I'm wrong, which happens often. We're not just talking 3D tracking left to right, up and down, but we are talking to and from. Ah, very good. Yes, I'm glad you clarified that. Yes, it's not just around the frame and around the plane of the frame. It is also to and from. Correct. That is 3D. the key with 3D tracking. As I was saying before, um, you, you know, with focus recompose, if you just recompose someone to the left or right of the frame, you know, you could get them in focus, but ideally you want to focus on them right till the very end because they could adjust their focus plane, their depth, your, their proximity to you just a little bit right. that it could be out of focus. So now that we're using all these 1.2, 1.4 lenses, shallow depth of field, it's become increasingly more important to have focus modes like these, even if you're not shooting a moving subject, even if you're just shooting a portrait in the studio, if you just wanted to recompose, it gives you much more flexibility. Okay. And then auto area AF, I'm guessing is similar to the areas we just discussed before, but it chooses. Uh, so auto area AF literally uses the entire frame. So what that does is, um, uh, unlike say wide area or dynamic, it's using a portion of the frame. It's using a, a even wide area AFL, wide area autofocus large, that uses a portion of the frame that you can move that red box around the frame. Auto area AF doesn't actually give you a box to move around the frame. It okay. uses the entire frame. And then if it detects, if you have subject detection layered on top of that, it, if it detects a person, it'll fine tune it to their eye or their face. Okay, makes sense. Uh, let's jump down now to AF subject detection options. Again, this is under the shooting menu, not the focus menu, which is under custom settings. We'll get to that in a second. So under photo shooting menu, AF subject detection options, and we've got this list here. Yeah, this is really important, especially those that are on the fence about moving to mirrorless cameras that are, might be still using DSLRs. This is something that's really exclusive only to a mirrorless camera. And as I said before, um, it it's a benefit from the type of autofocus system we're using. So what you see there um, uh, are essentially options that will be mimicked to some extent on a Z62 and a Z72, but now in a Z9, we have vehicles. So in auto, the first one is if it detects anything from a person to an animal to a vehicle, it'll detect it. You don't even have to tell it what to detect. However, um, if you wanted to isolate just people or just animals or just vehicles, you can pick those options subsequently in there and it won't look for people, for example, if you choose vehicles or it won't look for animals if you choose people. All right. Um, and then there's another important option right there, and that is simply subject detection off. So um, in the case where uh, you're shooting me right now, for example, 
Uh, if you did not want it to detect my face, for instance, and you wanted it to react to, say, maybe a product that I'm putting out on, on the camera like this, um, you know, right now it's detecting my face, but right now, see, if I, as long as I cover my face, it's not going to detect my face and it'll shoot right to the camera. But if I if I uh, bring the camera away, it detects my face, so it'll it'll focus on my eye. So some people may not want the subject detection there because it it wants it to ignore a uh, human face and it. Uh, say you're shooting a bouquet or something like that, and you just wanted to focus on the on the bouquet of a, a bride holding the bouquet in this proximity. You want to ignore the face, then you know you might want to just turn subject detection off. So now uh, oh, go this ahead. subject, I will add, this subject detection is only available in the auto area AF, the wide area AF, S and L, but also the 3D tracking, which is new. So for the Nikon DSLR customers, this is something we couldn't do on the DSLR. In the mirrorless camera now, we can actually layer subject detection on top of 3D, which is great for fine-tuning the focus. See, people, go to mirrorless. Just trust me. Go to mirrorless. My, the change to mirrorless for me was huge. One question for you, though, uh, just you know, quick helicopter view on this. But quite often, auto settings on any camera, it, it has to make a decision uh, which to detect. And so therefore, while it's minute and you may not notice it, sometimes there's a lag. Do you notice? In other words, is is there a reason most people that want some detection wouldn't just leave it on auto most of the time and would leave it on people most of the time? Is it faster if you just set people? Uh, I think what you're saying has some validity. Um, there's more processing involved. Yes. Um, exactly. More complex that you put your autofocus methods on. Um, and, you know, you probably can minimize that by going to, for example, just a single point, which is why I think a lot of people just prefer to go to a single point because it's quicker and, you know, they don't have to mess around with it messing up on your intention. Um, but the power in having these tools is that uh, you can really streamline your workflow if you can if you can wrangle the, the, the options there. But in terms of the lag, I think we've really minimized it now with this Z9 in particular. Uh, the processor in this one is 10 times more powerful than the even the Z7 II, which was our best processor wow. to date pr prior to that. So the, the gap between the Z9 and the Z7 II is 10 times because the processor is just that much more powerful. So I think that really minimizes the processing time. Uh, but I think the, the uh, utility in turning and uh, switching these different focus modes is to try to really uh, maximize what you're shooting. So if what you're shooting if you don't need to detect faces and that just gets in the way of your workflow because it's accidentally detecting faces, then you would want to turn that off. And, and in that case, you would get a faster workflow because you're just focusing on one particular square, for instance, instead of having the camera hunt for all these different subjects. And, and I will say that's why I said at the beginning, this is not a technical training because for John, this, you know, the answer for this may be completely different than for Sandy. And so your specific needs, the, the goal here is that you understand the options that do exist for you. So that's it under the shooting menu. Let's jump over to the custom settings menu, which is the pencil. And the second option there is focus, which is a, a, a focus specific sub menu of, you know, for lack of a better phrase, customizations that you can do, right? Custom settings. So let's run through these because, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least on every body I've ever shot, not so much for your average beginner, but as you get to intermediate and advanced, and this is the reason I, I do this show to focus on autofocus, the settings that are under here, many of them are what can help you go, jump to the next level. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Yeah, um, it might be intimidating at first because there's all those cryptic options as you see there, but uh, it will, once you learn to unlock them, I think uh, the more people play with their cameras, the more they see the power in these customizations. And as a matter of fact, all these customizations are born of user feedback. So it's actually the oh, uh, our, 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 our customers that are uh, stimulating this uh, these options. So we can go through these. Um, the, the, the first I guess, time I jumped uh, in here, yeah, by the way, I noticed how small the scroll bar was <laughs> and went, oh. how far does this thing go? And I will tell you, it goes really, really far. So let's start with AFC priority selection. Yeah, uh, and as just as a high level view, so that's typically in the pencil menu, which we call our custom uh, options in there. And this is a subsection within there called autofocus. Typically, it's always the first one, section A. And if you look at the uh, letters and the numbers there on the left-hand side, 
You'll see the ones with an asterisk on it. If you see one with an asterisk, that means it's changed from its default setting. So if we just, uh, so there's an icon there. And if you see an arrow going to the right, if you press the right on your pad there, uh, it'll reveal the options within that uh, section. So in here in AFC priority selection, you have release, focus and release and focus. So what this means is, is that when you're in AFC, okay, just when you're in AFC, um, uh, when you press the shutter release all the way down, this, this dictates how the camera will behave. Okay. So, um, if you're in, if you're in AFC, for instance, uh, you can have the camera in, in the case of a Z9, let's just say it's in 20 frames per second. We have a mode that goes 20 frames per second. Um, if you're in release, it will uh, honor that 20 frames per second. It'll just shoot at 20 frames per second. And um, even if your subject is out of focus, okay? So um, whereas okay. if you pick the last one there, if the camera hasn't deemed tack sharp focus, it will simply not fire. So therefore, if you have it on 20 frames per second, you might hear rat tat 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 and that's because if it does not detect 100% confirmation of focus it simply won't fire even if you have it at 20 frames per second so that is effectively giving the AFC focus priority so in that case you know your keeper rate should actually be 100% because as far as the camera is concerned, every shot that you take should be in focus. Right. Um, but you won't necessarily get 20 frames per second. So the happy medium is that focus and release. And as a matter of fact, you see that question mark button there. If you look on the physical camera itself, whenever you see the question mark icon, there's a question mark button on the camera itself. And if you hold it down, if you can find that, Steve, it's the same as the negative or the, the minus button. It's right beside the play button. So if you see that cluster of four buttons at the bottom of the yep. camera, the one to the left. Yeah. If you hold it down, it gives you a description of what that option is. And I'll just read it out to you. So uh, you can see here release is just what I described. The shutter can be released even if the camera is not in focus. And then if you scroll down uh, under focus and release, it says doing burst photography, the camera prioritizes focus for the first shot in each burst and frame advance rate for all subsequent shots. So what that means is that it wants to make sure that your first shot is in focus. So right. the camera won't start that continuous, you know, 20 frames per second until at least the first one is in focus. And then it will honor the 20 frames per second every subsequent shot after that. And now that I've revealed that the, uh, the uh, camera has all these uh, little helpful tips, I guess we can just let the viewers do that. And that's the end of this podcast. Dude. I was literally just going to say, you have an entire help <laughs> manual in here and you don't actually see that a lot. I actually really like that. And one of the things I, I find interesting, because you had made the comment that, you know, you'd have a hundred percent keeper ratio if you just did focus, right? But what people don't realize, you know, for example, when you do that and you do the ta-ta-ta, ta ta and there's a lag, sometimes, and that's why focus and release is nice, sometimes I don't care if it's a slight, I'm shooting a 2.8 and it's a slight shift off the focal plane, but it's still acceptable for whatever photojournalistic, you know, use I'm using. I don't need it. I mean, I want it to be tax sharp, but the truth is if I get the guy mid jump in the air, that matters to me more. Whereas if it, if it pauses right at the peak action where the punch hits the skin, I've got you know, problems at that point. Cause I, I literally missed the shot. So let's jump to uh, AFS priority selection and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is going to be similar, except that it's single shot instead of continuous. That's correct. So if, if you go in there, um, you, you see that uh, it doesn't even give you the option for the second one that you saw before, because typically you don't use, you use AF, uh, S, you don't really use it when you're in continuous release. But bottom line is, is that uh, this will behave the same way, um, focus or, or, or release, as you see there. Okay. Um, yeah. And next one, focus tracking with lock on. 
Right. Okay. So if you go into here, just press once to the right. So what this uh, oh. does is there, if there is, um, let's just say there is a, a obstruction between your you and your subject. So let's just say you're focusing on me and a player goes between me and you. So, you know, you're shooting me, I'm, I'm your target, I'm your subject. But then there is a, um, you know, say another player goes in front of me rather than the camera reacting to this right away, okay, you can delay its reaction so that it stays on me, um, even, you know, as, as the subject passes me. So the camera can be very erratic. It can be, it can be very sensitive to erratic movement. So you can fine tune that depending on how uh, jittery you want the autofocus to be. So if you want it to react to everything under the sun, you, you can put it to very quick and then um, and then you can also fine tune it to uh, stick on your in your primary subject for longer periods of time. So blocked yeah. shot is really not blocked per se, but you know, do you want me to assume whatever walked between me and my subject is going to go away fairly soon and wait for it to go away? Or do you want me to grab it? So what's the part at the bottom was steady and erratic? Yeah. So I think, um, I, I actually, if you, uh, hit that question mark button, I want to get a precise definition of this because <laughs> even sometimes my, my memories eludes me. It's, it's the rate of change when a subject is, is coming to you. So for instance, uh, a track and field runner that's running at you at a steady pace. That is a, a way that the, com the computer and the camera can interpret that acceleration right. in a way that is steady. Whereas if something is erratic, so for example, soccer, they're doing sudden stops and starts, you can um, fine tune the response of the autofocus to react to erratic movements, sudden stops and starts versus a steady flow of gotcha. acceleration or a steady velocity. Next one that we've got is focus points used. Right. So there are so many different uh, positions in the camera uh, that it might take a very long time for you to scrub through it one by one. You know, a lot of those people that are using single point or even the dynamic air, uh, area points, um, by moving the toggle, the joystick button on the back of the camera, you're effectively moving one position by one position and that may take time to move across the frame. By doing alternate points, you're skipping positions so you can move across the frame with greater ease, with uh, more rapidness, but with less precision. Changes so the grid depth, get, basically, yeah. Yes, yes. You'll have less precision, but you can move across the frame with greater ease. So depending on how quick you want to work, you can skip points if you wish. Okay. Store points by orientation, I will say, assuming in, in the Nikon world, this is what I think it is, this is a phenomenal tool, depending obviously on how you shoot, like Troy obviously has it turned off here. I love this if it's what I think it is. So let me know. Yeah, so it's especially uh, handy for a camera like the Z9 that has a built-in vertical grip. So as you would, uh, I think you already know, when you're shooting in the horizontal landscape mode, um, it, it, you, you, it will remember what position you put your focus point. However, um, if you're alternating between horizontal and vertical, um, if I'm composing my frame right now, maybe you're using rule of thirds and you want your subject to be so high in the frame. When you tilt the camera, you know, if your focus point is right here, okay, when I, when I tilt the camera, I, I want my focus point to be over here because that's typically where the head is going to be when you, when you tilt the camera. Um, it saves you time from shifting the focus point from say here, tick, 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 down to here. Okay, because maybe this is where I want to compose the head if I'm shooting vertically. Uh, you can have the camera memorize that because there's a, essentially a built-in gyroscope inside of the inside of the camera that detects what the orientation you're in, um, and then it can memorize that if you're shooting vertically, shooting for portrait, which will save you time moving the focus point. But also, um, there's an option there where you can actually customize the AF area mode to. Uh, to that particular orientation. So if you wanted to have it uh, group area AF versus single point when you're shooting uh, horizontally, you can further customize that as well and not just memorizing the focus position. 
and and I use this in live music where I may be shooting horizontal, you know, kind of like what you said, and I may take and move the focus point up and to the right to put the singer on a rule of third. I went off mic when I did that. But then, depending on which way I rotate the camera, that if the focus point stays the same focus point, even though I rotated the camera, it could end up at the bottom of the frame. And when I rotate, I want the focus point to readjust itself at the top on a rule of third so that I can just immediately recompose. And it, it comes in very, very handy there. So let's jump to the next one, which is AF activation. Currently it's on. Yeah. So we were talking about this before we did the segment. Uh, are we going to be talking about back button uh, focus? I, I think a lot of people want to immediately customize their camera for that, especially if they're coming from the, uh, say the photojournalism, sports photography uh, genre segments. Um, most people that shoot uh, action or movement are usually doing it in AFC. And the problem with AFC is that it's going to focus right up until the very end when you take the shot. That could be problematic because you, using AFC, may find the focus plane that you want. So you've tracked your subject and he lands on a focus plane and you don't want that focus plane to move. Well, right. there are a couple of ways to lock it in place. You, we have, you know, AF locking buttons, but rather than dedicating another button to locking focus and having to press two buttons now uh, at the same time, you'd have to lo hold your lock button and then press your shutter release. What you effectively do is you take the shutter release out of the equation when focusing. And that's really how to achieve back button focusing. The AF on button at the back of the camera is always going to auto focus. In order to achieve back button focusing, the key thing that you have to do is to deactivate the shutter release from focusing. So when you're using AFC, um, you can back button the entire time you wanna track your moving subject. And at such time, you don't want the focus plane to move, simply let go. And when you press the shutter release, it will no longer move from that plane of focus because the shutter release has no more function as it pertains to autofocus. It is simply to take the picture. So yep. that, I hope that makes sense. Uh, to people that are listening. Yeah, and and I will say, let me just add, because I use back button, I use a dual back button focus setup and my shutter is only the shutter. And I will tell people, because I know people who have tried it and said, yeah, I didn't like it. Let me just tell you, if you're going to try back button focus for the first time, give yourself two weeks. Force yourself to use it for two weeks. And I would wager, like not a lot, like maybe a dollar, but still, I'd wager that uh, once you start using it, you can't go back. The only problem I find with back button focus is when you hand your camera to someone else, <laughs> because exactly. I've had singers on a stage reach down and grab my camera and go around taking pictures. And they're all just a blob of blur because they, there was no focus going on, you know, whatsoever. Uh, all right. So let's jump to the next one. Focus point persistence currently off or auto. What are those? One of the uh, more valuable options uh, for people when they just want the, the scene to be uh, entirely recognized as auto area AF, okay? And just imagine if you have your sh uh, your shutter release set to auto area AF, it's looking at the entire scene, okay? It's looking at the entire scene. Now, you can also, for example, you can program a function two button, okay, to be not auto area AF. So let's just say, for example, single point. What... Uh, this focus point persistence does is that if you have it, uh, let's just say off, okay? Um, if you have a focus point over here, so let's say you have your single focus point over here, and with your shutter release, you're doing auto area AF. It's going to try to find whatever's in the scene. And then when you hit your F F2 button, um, it will still register as where it was over here, the original point over here. That is with uh, focus point persistence off. However, if you're, if you're using auto area AF and it discovers a subject right here, and, you, and then you subsequently hold down the F2 button, it'll go single point right to where, your, oh. where it was detected. So you could use it in, in synchronicity with auto area AF. So you could use auto area AF to find a subject 
And then when you want to lock onto it, you can have a, a persistent focus point, uh, lock on it and kind of like hone in on it. It's kind of like a, uh, fighter jet, you know, when they, when they've got tone or something like that, it's, it's finding a general area and then you've, you, you, the, the cameras, uh, found it. And then now you can kind of switch from guns to missiles. And then you can kind of like lock on your subject and hold it down with say a single point. So ideally you would use it, say with auto area AF and, and, and you would, uh, put your persistence to auto. And that way, when you're, when you're using the auto area AF to scan the entire scene for a subject, once you find that subject, you can hone in on it by using the single point. Let's just say, for example, using your function one or function two button right. and just using a single point at that very moment. So you've used auto area AF to do the heavy lifting. And then now once it's found your subject, you can pinpoint it with that. So ba basically the point. ability to find a subject on a broad scale and then once yeah. you find it, not only switch AF modes, but switch AF modes and wherever that AF mode used to be, make sure that AF mode not only switches to it, but goes to the current target, which location. makes total, yeah, yes. current location. Right. It makes total sense. I like that actually. Right. You know what? That's I, I, I would use that actually. Uh, I could see that coming in handy a lot, and I don't have a feature like that on my camera. I wish that I did. This Z9 looks better to me every time I touch it. Uh, so let's jump to the next one. Limit AF area mode selection. All right. So if you go into there, we have so many options to choose from. And then this really kind of, um, we didn't talk about the button on the side here of the camera, but essentially we can toggle through um, our options here for AF area mode. And as you can see, there are many of them. And and your, um, I think his name is Troy, the, <laughs> the person you loan the camera from, he doesn't need all of them. So you don't have, when you're toggling through your options, it's one less tick of the dial to access the ones that you need. So in, as you can see here, the, the boxes that aren't checked, it will simply ignore that as you're toggling through these AF area modes. Um, making your, your, your workflow quicker. So you can, if you know you're only toggling between two options, just keep those two boxes checked and it'll speed up your workflow. You had mentioned that button. So if I just jump to, to that button that's up in the front, you'll see at the top, the two end up colored. So when I let it go, they're white. When I hit it, they end up colored. And then explain right. to me which dial does which. Uh, so by default, the main... Uh, command dial, which is your thumb here at the back that usually controls the shutter. It will control the the difference between AFC, AFS, or MF. So just by uh, holding this button here down and then jogging the back wheel with your thumb, you'll be able to adjust between, as you can see there, uh, AFC, uh, AFS, and MF. And within each one, as you can see, their MF that was blank because there are no uh, subsequent AF area modes within MF. Right. So you see there right beside it, it's blank. But once you go into AFC, for instance, now you're working with not only wide area AFL, but you have layered on top of it subject detection. That's why you see those three icons there. One's a face, one's an animal, one's a, it says auto detect, right? So with the front dial, that's where your aperture is at. When you're holding this button here on the side of the camera, and rotating the front dial where your aperture would be, you are fine tuning what um, AF area mode method you're using within AFC. So um, I think what we said, we, we, we deactivated a couple of those. So it simply wouldn't come up when you're toggling right. it this way. Okay, perfect. I like that too. That's actually a really handy thing. So now let's jump into focus mode restrictions. Yeah, so essentially here is that if you, while you're jogging your wheel, if you don't want to accidentally, you know, access any of these um, other options, you can simply relegate it only to continuous AF. So accessing single and manual is not even an option, put it that way. So when you're holding that button down, you won't even access the other ones. Makes sense. Uh, focus point wrap around, which it's so funny. I'm curious if, if same for you. So many people I know hate this. I can't live without this personally. So explain focus point wraparound, which is just, it's a toggle either on or off. 
Yes, toggle on off. And this is a new functionality on the Z9 too. Usually we'd have to go into another screen, select on or off here. It's just toggle right. Just keep pressing right and it'll toggle on and off. So that's a new um, user interface option that we have with the Z9. So essentially, once you hit the end of the frame, um, if you wanted to get to this side of the frame, you'd literally have, if you didn't have wrap, you would have to press the, uh, the cursor several times to make it to the other end of the screen. When wrap is on, if you hit one end, it will loop around and the next uh, press, it will end up on this side. So yeah. okay. it's, uh, it's just a little bit more expedient. Uh, next one is focus point display and the sub menu has three on off options. Right. Okay. So focus point display. So even if you're, say, for example, you're on manual focus. Okay. So for example, if you took the manual focus switch on the lens there and deactivated focus altogether, you could still in that option there, if you had it on, you could still see a square and effectively um, you could use that square uh, to be um, give an indicator of whether or not the, the image is in focus. So I think we were talking before, if you're using manual focus, sometimes you don't use it, but for people that do, um, we have a few aids here that you could use. Uh, one of them is uh, focus peaking. Um, that's when um, parts of the image will glow if it's in peak focus. Um, the other one is simply just using your uh, focus point, and if it turns green, then uh, it would be in focus. Okay. Even while you're doing manual focus. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, Sounds good. Uh, Built-in AF assist illuminator. Again, this is just a toggle of on or off. Right. Okay. So this applies only if you're shooting an AFS. So if you're shooting an A autofocus single, um, there is a green AF assist illuminator here. So what that does is if the image is, if the scene is too dark, it'll shoot out a green beam and that will help the autofocus system uh, detect whatever's in front of it. It has a limited range. Uh, it can only go so far, but uh, ideally if you're in a very dark situation, uh, it will shoot that green beam, but only if it is an AF Yes. Okay. If you don't want that green beam to come on because it's very distracting or it's off-putting or it will, you know, uh, uh, cause problems within the scene or you don't want to attract, attract attention to yourself, you can simply turn it off. Um, that option is not a, is not available if you're shooting on AFC. So it's only avail it's only relevant if it's on AFS. If you were an AFC, it would be on all the time, effectively. Uh, yeah, because it would be right, assisting exactly. a continuous focus. So I mean, exactly. That's you, why it doesn't make sense to have it on an AFC, right? Yeah, You're right. Flashlight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, focus peaking, which you mentioned just a second ago, and again, for especially for people doing manual focus, focus peaking to me is one of the best inventions of the last number of years. As we've gotten into cameras being computers, uh, sub menu is three different options. What do we have? Okay, so um, let's start off with the, the first one. That's just having peaking uh, on or off altogether. So for instance, if you put your camera or your lens in manual mode and you didn't want to see peaking at all, you turn that option off, okay? If you have it on, the moment that you put it into manual focus, then it will reveal uh, the peaking. So okay. the peaking will effectively make parts that are in sharpest contrast glow. And the subsequent options that you have in the menu there, um, first of their peaking sensitivity is how much it glows. So the, the third one there, that's the most obvious. Um, but if you wanted to have a more subtle peaking, you would put it to low. So you would see it, uh, the glowing edges uh, around the areas of high contrast um, the least uh, evident. It would be the least evident if it's on low sensitivity. So if you wanted, if you found the peaking very distracting to your composition, you might be tempted to put it on low. Um, me, myself, I rarely use peaking because I find that the EVF resolution is so high, I can actually detect whether or not something is in focus just by the EVF. But if you like that added um, benefit, especially if you're using the screen or a separate screen or monitor through the HDMI, that is a very handy feature. I know a lot of video people do that. I will say for for critical focus or manual focus, like for me, if I'm, if I'm photographing the moon through my telescope, so I connect my camera to the telescope, depth of field is very, very shallow. So I can be photographing the moon and it can totally be blurry and one crater can be sharp. 
this can be handy for me to verify exactly where I want the sharpness, especially if you're going to do, you know, multiple shot, you know, pano or something like that. Uh, and then focus peaking color. Interesting. Troy has it in red because normally yeah. I, I would choose yellow for this because it stands out to me. Well, it all depends. I mean, if you look at my background right now, you wouldn't choose yellow because my background is completely yellow. Oh yeah, so good point. It all depends when uh, what what type of uh, background. That's why we give you you several options because uh, it, just like you said, yellow is the most evident, and I agree with that. However, if there's a predominance yeah. of yellow in your scene, you would go to another color. Yeah, it's more okay. contrasty. Makes total yeah. sense. Okay, next one is the last one under the custom settings menu for the focus category. And that is manual focus ring in AF mode. And it's a toggle either on or off. Essentially, when you're holding your camera, the posture you have is you usually hold the lens like so. Okay. And uh, this may cause inadvertent touching of the manual focus ring. And when you have the manual focus ring in play, it can override the autofocus. Um, some people may like this because they may want the ability to override the, the autofocus maybe just at the very last second, just tweak it ever so slightly. Um, but if you find that you're inadvertently touching it just by the posture of holding the lens, you can deactivate that altogether. So you're wholly reliant on the autofocus to determine your focus plane. Okay. Makes sense. And that does it for the custom settings menu, sub uh, focus sub menu, and all the options that are under that. But there are some other options under controls that let you kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of take all the different settings that we've talked about that let you customize your autofocus experience and better utilize them with the physical camera itself. So under controls. Yeah, I mean... There's a lot of buttons on the camera. So, for instance, you can utilize different buttons to enact different autofocus methods. So, in the case of, say, you want to use your primary shutter release, okay, where your index finger is, right. to be auto area AF, let's just say, okay? That's the way you want it to behave. However, uh, you may want uh, to immediately change to dynamic, or let's just say you immediately want to change to 3D, okay? Got Without it. having to go in the menus, you can program one of the buttons to behave uh, like it's 3D tracking, but just by pressing it. So, for instance, uh, maybe a lot of people out there are looking at back button focusing, so the, the shutter release is completely disabled. You can program, say, the function 3 button to be uh, auto area AF, you can punch in the function two to be 3D tracking. You can do the AF on to be single point. So depending on the way you want the camera to focus on whatever particular subject you're shooting, you can change the method by assigning it to a particular button. So um, which, which let me just interject that. is really handy because the normal way that you would change, although it's not that long, but the normal way that you would change one of those is, I don't want to use the word permanent because obviously it's not permanent, but it's, you know, it's intended to be there for a while, right? I have to go through a process, change it, and now I'm in 3D. I have to go through a process, change it, and this. But there are times that in an individual scenario, I may want to, you know what, just for this moment while the singer is coming right up to my face... I may want something different than when he was back at the microphone stand. The ability for me to very quickly for this moment, hit one button, change that mode, and then let that button go and go right back to where I was ahead of time is, is advantageous. Yes. So where we would find some of these options is in that F2 right there. So this is custom controls that have to do with when you're shooting. So when you're actually in the physical mode of shooting. So you see there, uh, you, you have a graphic on the left-hand side and whatever is the active thing that we're talking about, it'll change to yellow. So if you scroll down, just go around, it'll go to the back of the camera. You can assign all these various buttons, different functions. Even if you have a lens that has a function button on it, you can assign uh, that uh, button to be a certain 
a value. So if you see there, if you had a 70 to 200, for example, it has two function buttons on it. One of them you can assign to AF on. And if you dig in, into that, say you go to that LFN2 to one to the right over there, uh, and then press that. Uh, there is another layer here. So you can have your lens focus. You can have it activate focus. But furthermore, you see the option above it and you can have it not only initiate focus, but you can have it, um, you can assign it to a particular method. So if you dig one deeper, um, oh. there you go. So now you can have the, the function button on the lens, not only initiate focus, but initiate it in either dynamic area, wide area, the whole litany of, of lists right there, uh, including 3D tracking. So if, you know, uh, like I said, 3D tracking, you might not want to use all the time. You, you might want to use auto area AF because there are many, many things in the scenes you just want to grab onto. But if you know you want to be more precise, you can just assign different buttons to different focus methods. And that's essentially where you find that. Uh, all right. So there we go with controls. Is there anything in the Z9 now, before we touch on really quickly firmware 2.0, what did, what did I miss? Uh, maybe I'll just touch on two things. Um, uh, one is the I button. So uh, I know we showed the how to access the menus from the shooting menu, as well as through the button at the side of the camera here. Right. But uh, one easy way, uh, graphical user interface is that when you press the I button, uh, there's a physical I button on the camera, it reveals these 12 positions. And these 12 positions can actually be customized uh, to do whatever you want. So I, 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 I saw a YouTube video where one guy set all 12 of them to do, I think, the same thing because he didn't have any use for really? anything else. And he just wanted it to be the same thing. So, uh, but uh, I'll give him that. Yeah. yeah right. Uh, but uh, in the upper, by default, in the upper right hand corner there, those are the two most um, prominent options. Now this has probably been customized uh, by our colleague there, uh, but typically the, uh, the two options there in the upper right hand corner have to do with autofocus and that you see is the AFC. Uh, you can touch that through the touch screen or your your, your trackpad um, and you can pick one of those. And then uh, the other one right there, AF's, AF area mode. And this is key here too, is once you go into that, you will see there is option for subject detection at right. the bottom. So this is an easy way to access that as well. Um, one, you know, one tip that I will give people, and I found this uh, myself because everybody is, uh, looking for ways to make things work faster. So um, one of the questions that I get, I'm just trying to reenact the situation here in my camera here, is say for instance, they want to find a quick way of turning, uh, say, uh, subject detection on or off. Right. So uh, one, one quick way that you can do this is if you have let's just say, um, if you hit the I button right now, we'll show this at okay. home on the screen. So that's your, you're shooting right now, right? Right. Um, if you wanna have a quick way to turn uh, subject detection off, if you press the I button, okay? And if your box is already on that option, all you have to do is take your index finger and, and toggle the front dial just one position Okay. So your front dial here on the index finger right Ooh. there and you immediately bring that up. So it's a quick way to bring <laughs> this menu item up. And now you can just do with one switch, you can toggle because it, it rolls to the left or right. You can, you can toggle it off, for example. So I think if you, if you jog that, uh, right. Like subject yeah, detection off. off. Yeah. And then you can just, from there, you can just tap your shutter release and you're off to shooting. Right. So those little, just little, little quick, quick things that you can do there. Oh, that's handy as heck. Yeah. Right. And, um, all right. You know, I like that. Maybe just one more, because I know sure. that a lot of people use this. Dude, I will and, go through uh, anything you want to go through. What do you got? Uh, let's go back to F2 and that is the custom settings, uh, okay. custom controls F2. Now, 
Um, there is a way to re uh, recall your settings. So we bring it back up on screen and let's just say, right on. Yeah, okay, so let's go to the uh, F2 section, yeah, and dig one menu deep into that. So from here, let's go to a let's go to an option like uh, function two right there. Let's just say that function two, okay. And if you hit OK on that, and uh, we're gonna have to scroll a little bit here. So we're trying to find something called recall shooting functions. Got so it. So what? There it is. So you see, there's an arrow there. So if you press one to the right, you can assign the function button to recall your shooting mode. So if you want your shooting mode to be, in this case, it's program auto, but let's let's just say you shoot manual exposure for the most part, but you you want you want the camera to shoot in, in, in uh, aperture priority, go to the shooting mode, go to that shooting mode row. And if you press once to the right, um, you can turn, yeah, you can turn that on and off and you can recall um, that that um, that mode um, that you have it currently set to. So, or or actually, cur um, there it is then, right there. Then, there it is, yeah. It's interesting. I just noticed this though, and that is, I was looking for the little arrow telling me there was a sub menu. So I was hitting, I was actually hitting the OK button. There is no right. arrow here, but if you hit right on the the D pad, uh, you get to here. That's right. It, it, I guess it should have an arrow, but if you look, uh, go back, go back one to the left. If you look at the bottom right there, you see it says set. Yep. That's what, the that's what made set, me click it actually. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you can set it to say, for example, I, I, I was. And, and real quick, let's just say those buttons down at the bottom. Let me go full screen so people can see them. Those buttons down at the bottom where it says, okay, set and done. Whatever menu you're in, always look down there because there will be something right. like that middle one that shows push right on the D-pad to, to set something. Right, right, right. So as it pertains to focus here, if you if you go in back in this menu here and you scroll down to the bottom um, right there, oh. you can have it recall uh, your favorite uh, or your preferred AF area mode. <laughs> so um, not only will it recall all those other settings i think it can even it can remember your iso value for instance it can remember if it's auto iso it can remember your metering your, your white metering. balance yeah. right your af area so basically mode, what uh, you're saying is you can you can set up that custom function button to whatever it is as changing almost all the settings you would care about by holding that button now Right, and the, that's the key thing. You have to hold the button down. Right. So this only applies so long as the button is being held down. What I will mention is that in the um, Z9 firmware 2.0, which I think by the time this is released, there will be an option to have the same recall shooting functions with hold in parentheses. So if you go back to that previous menu right there, so in the new option, there will be recall shooting functions as well as recall shooting functions hold. So that what that means is that once you press it, once you tap the button once, it will stay on So that. it literally is a memory, recall the camera back to these settings and don't make me hold the button. Don't make you hold the button. And then if you want to dismiss it, just tap it again. Ooh, okay. That right there. So th that kind of is a good segue actually, uh, getting into firmware two. So- right. Many of you already know about the news. Firmware 2 comes out on the, what is today? The 19th. So it comes out on the 20th of April. We're recording this on the 19th. And this should be out actually on the 21st. So it should be available by the time you get this or, or see this. But Firmware 2, I don't want to go through all the the things. There's there is a ton in this firmware. If you're a video shooter, let me just tell you, Firmware 2 is like, and, I, and I'm saying this is not an icon shooter, right? Firmware 2 could have been a new camera. Like Firmware 2 is like making a beast of a camera, a whole new camera again. It's that good, especially if you're a video shooter. But specific to photography stills and for autofocus, uh, I know that there are some zone style changes. So what are those that are coming in, in yeah. two? The most important one is a custom wide area. So we went all throughout those options there with the different boxes, single point, dynamic, wide area, 
AFS, wide area AFL, uh, 3D tracking, and then there's the auto area. What we did with the Z9 is we made um, the ability to make custom shapes and custom boxes in one of 20 different orientations. So you could literally have a slit that goes down vertically on the frame or a slit that goes horizontally across the frame. So if you can imagine an application, maybe you're shooting tennis and uh, you don't know if the player is going left or right through the frame. However, you do know that they're gonna be a certain height in the frame. So you can, instead of having one focus point here and then you'd have to track the player left and right or maybe using 3D tracking, you can, you can basically isolate an entire row, a slit that will cover um, say, you know, this height of the frame and ignore the net that's below it. Or, you know, if you wanted to compose uh, something on the right-hand side of the frame, you'll ignore everything on the left-hand side of the frame. And you can expand that box as big and as small as you want. Not only that, but you can use actually a single point. You can make it one by one. And what's great about the wide air, the custom wide area is you can also layer on top of that subject detection. Okay. which is what the single point can't do. So that's oh, the so you can do single point plus subject detection effectively. Yes. Yes. Oh, dude. Okay. All right. I like that. You know, the first thing I thought of when I saw this in the, the press release on the firmware was you being a sports shooter was hurdles. And I'm at the far end and I'm, I'm photographing these people doing hurdles coming at me and they're constantly getting in front of a hurdle that's closer to me. And I don't want it to, which is effectively, a, especially if I'm up in a press box or up in the stands, I don't want it to see each hurdle as they go through as another subject interruption. They go, oh, do I want to grab that one? Oh, do I, oh, another hurdle. Do you want me to focus on that? Whereas you could theoretically kind of limit it. I, I, I think that's, that's handy that's, as heck. That's actually literally the example that we use for our marketing materials, hurdlers. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For that, for that application. So yeah, that's, that's one case you'd use it in. All right, so let's finish up with uh, some listener questions. I've got two. Actually, the first guy sent three, but he's allowed to because it's Troy who lent me the camera. So Troy Miller, uh, a buddy of Thank mine, you, an amazing wedding photographer, imagery concepts at on Instagram. And then Troy's like fine art and he loves black and white and he loves infrared. Spicy Jello or Spicy Jello underscore BW for black and white on Instagram. So Troy Miller wanted to know the following, and this was interesting to me. Uh, and his main question on what I'm about to say is, is this an intended behavior, if you can answer this at all? So as a wedding photographer, he uses face and eye detection. He uses it with wide area autofocus mode. So you basically, you get, and you saw it when I brought this screen up here. Let me bail out here. So you can see, uh, if I pull this up, there is a, a red box that I can move around in the screen, right? Well, yes. what he says here is, you know, you've got the red selection area and often the camera will find eyes or face outside of the wide selection area. It's not always a problem, but it's frustrating when he's shooting a couple and he only wants the camera to focus on one of the two subjects, right? So there's two of them. He puts the box over one of them, but the face and eye detection is grabbing the person's face and eyes that are outside of the box. Is that in, so in other words, this would be a perfect example if he was doing the bouquet to turn off face and eye detection, right? But in this case, he wants the face and eye detection, but he wants it to stay inside the box. So is it intended? And how does he keep the camera from focusing outside the selected area? Well, the, uh, the okay, good question. First of all, Troy, uh, even with the Z6 II and Z7 II, there was a little bit of forgiveness uh, or a radius rather, where you could actually detect a face outside of the box. And I think that accommodated for faces that were like half in the box and half out. So it would, um, sense, it would detect yeah. those faces. Now with the Z9, the radius is actually a little bit larger. So it um, will detect faces, a good area around the box, just giving it, giving you that added flexibility. I think that was an intentional design by the engineers. To so do. that's what's biting I can under them. Right, I can understand his dilemma in not being able to uh, pick which face. Now, if he wants to pick the face, I would recommend he goes to auto area AF because with auto area AF, you can actually toggle between the eyes. So if you have three or two people in the picture, you can toggle between their four eyes. 
which um, is, by the way, this was the, his, I said he had three questions. This is the last one. And that was, right. how do I switch to a different eye in the scene if the camera does not pick the intended one? And what you just said, though, was if he's using wide area, he can't? Right. Yes. So if it's in wide area, you can't pick the eye. Okay. However, however, with firmware 2.0, like I told you, we have the custom boxes now. So effectively, um, you, you can, can shrink the boxes. Oh, right. So okay. it is not, you know, in the dilemma that he had, it's picking the an unintended person. You can narrow the box to have it uh, smaller. So it's only looking for eyes around, even around a one point, one by one point. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. might be a good solution for him with Firmware okay. 2.0. Uh, next question was from Steve Roberts. It's Steve Roberts photo on Instagram. And let me just preface this by saying, and I said it at the beginning, that this isn't a technical training. There, there's no way for us to really answer a question like this because me as a music photographer, I can tell you right now, if I'm in a photo pit photographing a concert with three other music photographers, there is no way in hell, if we all have the same camera body, there is no way in hell we have the same settings. It, and, and I don't just mean exposure settings. Now, periodically, we'll say to each other, uh, hey, Mark, uh, what do you got your ISO at? Okay, that's different. But in general, I may choose to go a higher shutter speed. I know people that will photograph somebody jumping in the air at 1 25th of a second, right? I may want 500th of a second. But even autofocus, I may choose, I, I know people who always use a single point. And then they recompose. I don't do that. I move my focus point around, but I don't use a zone, right? So that everybody's going to be different. With that in mind, here's his question, uh, again, from Steve. What settings are best for football with a D5? Ah, uh, that's interesting because the D5, I think if you go on our website, does have, um, if I do recall, there is a manual that goes through various sports giving our recommendations. Um, football. Uh, I've shot football as well with the D5, as a matter of fact. And if you're asking me what I would do, I would probably pick 3D tracking. Um, however, uh, I'm trying to recall, I think the D5, wow, I think the D5 also has something like a group area um, tracking. But I think for the most part, I have liked the 3D tracking because in football, they can quickly move laterally throughout the frame right. quicker than I can track them. And as a matter of fact, there are times where I'm taking a sequence of shots and I don't want to track them. I don't want to keep them in the middle of the frame. I want to lock onto them on the right. And as they're progressing from right to left of the frame, I want to get those shots and not only are they progressing from right to left, their their depth is changing. So imagine they're going diagonal throughout the frame. Mm -hmm. 3D tracking is great for that. So I would probably recommend that you uh, use 3D tracking and um, get, I, I would probably leave it at the center point. What's What I always do is I leave 3D tracking on the center point, grab focus of the player, and then allow them to roam freely through the frame and let the that magnetic 3D focus point keep them in focus and then recompose as I see fit. I so love that's that probably idea. The best magnetic yeah. focus point. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So we're going to switch gears, but before we do, I'm going to rely on your expertise. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked or that we need to talk about that somebody is going to leave in the comments somewhere yeah. going, why didn't you ask? X. Is there anything major? I mean, we can't touch on everything. That's why this is just an autofocus show, right? There's a lot to this camera beyond autofocus, but is there anything autofocus wise I left out? Yes. I'll um, mention two things that pertain to video. So video is very different than photo in the respect that in video, people want to be able to adjust the speed of their focus. That's not really a thing with photography because nobody really cares right. how quickly or how slowly you got to focus. Usually you want to go to get your focus as quick as possible. That's what the photo mode does. However, in video mode, in the G, the custom section, G section, you can slow down the rate at which the focus pulls. So there's a focus speed option. I want people to know about that. So, um, and secondly, there is, you won't find in the video mode an option 
for AF. Um, oh, you, you'll find in the uh, focus mode in the video section AFF, which you will not find in stills mode. Okay. So AFF, what that stands for is auto focus full time. And that means that it will track focus without any intervention, meaning to say it does not require you to hold a button down like AFC, for example, because right. the idea is a lot of time, like right now I'm filming myself, um, nobody's pressing the button, um, but it's automatically tracking me because I have it on AFF, autofocus full time. That's a, a video specific feature. And then lastly, I was going to say on video, um, depending, it's not autofocus, but on manual focus in video, you also have something uh, called uh, linear focus. So um, on select lenses, namely the 70 to 200 at this point, uh, if you're manually focusing, you can do it at specific degrees. So you can program a quarter turn, a half turn of the lens um, to achieve focus, depending how precise you want the, the focus pull to be. Okay. Just All good for ones. Manual focus. So let's yeah. switch gears. We're going to close out with a speed round. Answer these as fast as you can. What's your, since you're a, mainly a sports shooter because you've got four kids in sports, yeah. what's your top sports photography tip? Oh, uh, boy. Uh, stop. <laughs> um, custom white balance is, uh, is a good one because all the arenas are different white balance. So learn yes. how to use the pre on there. Okay, good tip. Nobody has ever said that one. That's a great tip. <laughs> it's, that's uh, not a good focus. If you're shooting raw, you can change it after the, the fact. But if you want to get sure. closer, you can set it in camera. Favorite composition rule if you have one? Uh, I like rule of thirds, but uh, in terms of focus composition, um, I, 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 I would say use 3D tracking and then you can play with composition to your heart's content. Okay. <laughs> Favorite album or song or artist? Ooh, album, song, or artist. Uh, uh, speed round, right? Oh, boy. Uh, I like uh, <laughs> this one so that Tupac, you know. Because I just went to the California, Tupac. So, okay. yeah, that's my favorite artist right Cal now. California love. Time. Yeah. Favorite drink? Favorite drink. Um, I'm a Canadian, so Tim Hortons ice caps. Ooh. Interesting. Yeah, I'm okay. not a Dunkin' Donuts guy. Tim Hortons Ice Cap. Yeah. And this one is is a separate one. Doesn't have to be speed round. Is there a photographer that's out there today that you think more people should know about? Hmm. Yeah, you know what? Um, since we're talking about um, all this this great stuff, we have a uh, he's an ambassador for us, but uh, he does really interesting work in terms of double exposure. I think people should check out uh, Andrew Hancock's Instagram site because we have these, he's known as a sports photographer, but he does this really artistic double, triple, quadruple exposure in camera without Photoshop. Very interesting layering of, of his subjects with, uh, it could be the skyline of Dallas, for example. Um, and, uh, he does a lot of, you know, professional sports, but I, we actually, uh, uh, are really impressed by them just for his, uh, multiple exposure work. So I would say, check out uh, a guy named Andrew Hancock. Okay. Of, I will uh, put a link to Dallas, Andrew. I'll, oh, good to know. I will put a link to Andrew in the show notes. I'll do his website if he's got one and I'll do uh, his Instagram too, which brings me to you from a Nikon point of view. If people want to reach out to you, uh, the Nikon website is. Oh, NikonUSA.com. And Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all of those are at Nikon USA. And then the question is, if you want to share it, and if you don't want to, I understand. Uh, but if people want to follow you on Instagram or anywhere, do you have any social media that you want to share of yours? <laughs> uh, in, in, I'm on Facebook as well. There's a lot of Marcuses on Facebook, if you can find me. But uh, no, uh, my, my Instagram is just kind of uh, travels and things like that. Uh, it's it's kind of a weird name, but Suma Cruz Laude uh, in, um, oh, I like in it. Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Very, very cool. I like it. All right. So again, uh, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate your doing this. And we should sh give a shout out to Jeffrey who helped arrange all of this and set all this up. And this show could not have been done without him. And he helped even with the camera earlier. So thank you to Jeffrey. But Mark, I appreciate your time. This has been a lot of time for you. And I know you're East Coast, so it's later for you. 
Uh, so Mark Cruz, Nikon USA, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. And someday I will meet you and buy you a drink in person. Oh, that's great. Looking forward to it. And to everybody, make sure that you go check out the show notes for this show. I've got a bit that I wrote about Mark and about, you know, autofocus in general for me. Uh, the show notes are at behindtheshot.tv. Just find this episode. Of course, I want to remind you that the podcast itself, this is a podcast first and foremost. The podcast is available in an audio only version wherever you get your podcasts. And if the place you get your podcast supports video like Apple Podcasts, there is a separate feed for behind the shot video. You can get it there. And if you don't have that with your podcast outlet like Spotify or something like that, you can always get the uh, video over on YouTube. Again, to everybody, thank you so much for the support. Please do, if you're using Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, drop a star rating, drop a written review, do the same thing on YouTube. If you'd give us a thumbs up, it would be very much appreciated. My name is Steve Brazel. This is Behind the Shot. Make sure you join us on the next show as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by going behind the shot. Thank you.